the, the Board of Education meeting to order. And welcome everybody back. Yes. Um, back. back in the routine. Hope everybody's had a great start to the year. Um, let's start as we always do with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. No, she's, yeah. um, uh, yes, we get to start with a little bit of a celebration. So we have our current teacher of the year here this evening. So Diane Tobio, if you could stand up for a second. We'd like to formally recognize you. So this one was really fun, and it was <laughs> it was really fun, and it was neat that um, many of the board members, you know, due to schedule, were able to be there because they saw what we uh, how we kind of opened the school year with an Olympic theme and had a lot of fun with it. But the show uh, was won by Miss Tobio, who, <laughs> who entered with the Trojan head mascot on and worked each so section of the crowd into a frenzy as. Miss Lemke introduced uh, her, and um, it was just awesome. I mean, the energy was wonderful, and it, it was really great to get us going. Diane teaches uh, Spanish to our fourth through sixth graders uh, in multiple elementary schools, so she sees just about as many students as anybody in the district. She's done so for nine years. She has the number. How many How many students? Um, the Last year was 487, oh, this yeah. year 492. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. <laughs> that was a that's big fine. number. <laughs> yeah, and um, so she has a, a great impact. She spreads great energy. She, uh, in her speech, really talked about community and fit with our theme of kind of the Olympics and ter carrying the torch for kids. Uh, it was wild to learn a little bit more, you know, personally about you that the last time you were in that gym, you were speaking at graduation and Neil was the principal. Oh, yes. yes. So it kind of, <laughs> kind of put things in, in perspective. Um, so it was great. Um, you know, we're so proud of you, Re really are, in, in terms of, you know, each year, the Teacher of the Year really represents that teacher voice for us in this district in different forums throughout the state. Uh, and we know you'll be, uh, you'll do a great job with that, Diane. You know, you're super passionate about what you are, what you do. You're super committed and super dedicated. Uh, and we're excited for you. And you bring that positive energy and juice, which we all need more of. You Completely know, so. inspiring. Yeah, it yeah, was. Absolutely. It was. So um, yeah. from the gift cards yeah. to <laughs> the, <laughs> the mascot yeah. to the games we put the, the staff through, it was really, yes. it was, it was nothing short of brilliant. It was, uh, yes, it was a lot of fun. So congratulations to you. I look forward to spending the night with you at the Bushnell yes, as you get honored at the state level. You have your family here tonight, so I you, have to, you have to do a few introductions yeah. for us. So all right. go ahead. Well, first of all, I'm so grateful to be here. So thank you so much. Um, and the theme, my theme was community when I spoke at Convocation. If you were there, as you said, it was just such a feeling of support and love. And um, there's no better way to continue that than to be here with four of the most important people in my life. This is my husband, Alex. This is my mother, my father, and this is um, our little one, Ava, who is rolling her eyes currently. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. Overrated. Yeah, I just want to say, I had so much fun at Convocation, and the, the love and support has continued already into the school year, and I just feel so grateful and so blessed to have had that opportunity. And if there's one thing I want to leave here tonight is that I just want that feeling of community to be used as much as we can because Simsbury is an amazing place. I grew up here. I now am fortunate to work here and um, it really has helped me become who I am in so many different aspects and I hope that as a teacher, as board members, as community members, we all remember that the children are watching us and we need to lead with, lead with love always. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. You don't need to stay for the All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to see you all. Yes. <laughs> Bye. Have a great night. So nice to see one. you. Yes. That was fantastic. <laughs> that was great. Oh, oh, nice meeting you. Nice seeing you. And she, she really was a convocation. She was off 
which is fantastic. Oh, fantastic. It's just amazing. Yeah. You did great. You. That's the babysitter as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Moving on to public audience. Switch it up a little, but. All right. Hi. Welcome back. I'm Lori Boyko, 15 Oakhurst Road. I don't have much time, and the board has been on a nice three-month-long vacation since the last June 11th meeting. So I'll skip the pleasantries and encouraging words and get right to the point. Simsbury has a long history of painting a much rosier picture of what life is like here than is actually the case. We are exceptional at sweeping issues under the rug that shouldn't be discussed in polite company while virtue signaling that all is well in Stepford or Mayberry when in fact life plays out much more like the town of Fairview in Desperate Housewives. I bet no one here knows that Wilton, Connecticut, not unlike Simsbury, was the inspiration for the Stepford Wives. It, it should come as no surprise that our schools have adopted a curriculum of actually indoctrinating students in how to speak while giving every student numerical social credit scores for personal qualities in the data portal that brands students with a digital footprint for perpetuity. What? It's not going in their transcript, you say? Am I the only one who's had my medical file data with personal information hacked, despite all of the laws to protect us and assure our data is safe? Do you expect me to believe the outside vendors we use are more secure than the medical and financial companies that are breached daily? Recording social, student social grading scores needs to stop immediately. Did the Board of Ed even discuss or approve this? Did I miss the public discussion and vote? In the first five school days, the high school students had no fewer than four sessions on how to use everyday speech to talk nicely to one another and to all be friends. First of all, I don't want my child to speak like some sing-songy dystopian drone. That's totally creepy and, con and compelled speech. More importantly, I don't want him to be friends with everyone. In fact, there are a very real number of people here in Simsbury I actually want him to stay completely away from. Starting with the ones vaping and doing drugs in the bathrooms <coughs> or mobs knocking the head of security to the ground, then celebrating it on social media. But we don't talk about that. Why in the world does a school district think it's their place to insist everyone befriend each other? Why are our schools spending their time teaching this social emotional nonsense when school achievement is abysmal? Where have the academics gone? Has the Board of Ed even authorized this everyday speech curriculum? Was it reviewed and approved by the curriculum committee and the board? When? That's required by law, you know. It's your responsibility. On August 19th, I requested copies of all the materials, minutes of the meetings in which the board reviewed, discussed, and approved it, and the cost to the district. I was offered a half-hour meeting to discuss with the Director of Equity and Access who implemented this. I want to see the official review and approval. If this curriculum has not been previously properly reviewed and approved by this board, then the program needs to cease and desist immediately. Thank you. Else? Um, uh, committee reports, communications, start with Josh. Uh, nothing yet. Uh, we are working on getting a September meeting, working with Nail and Katie on getting something set up for the communications subcommittee mm -hmm. to meet in September. So we'll have something coming soon. Nothing yet at this time. Please? Of course. Some <laughs> just kind of came by, went by, but um, so there we've been. Between Haven and CAC CREC and NSBA, we've sort of had the time this summer to, to review a lot of things and sort of get a jump start on what's going on. So again, we're actually starting with some questions for the General Assembly candidates about educator workforce and state support and providing mental health services, school safety and security, and a number of things. Mandate reduction, of course, being one of them. So these are things that we've been really working on that we're going to try to um, develop a platform and um, before you know it, January will be here. Um, on the CREC scene, we 
celebrated our fifth anniversary, Craig had received a big state grant for transition to teaching. And um, this program was great for teacher resident residency candidates. And so we've placed over 130 candidates all around the state within the program. So it really is a is um, you know kudos to 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 these to these um, residents that have pursued this track for for education. So unfortunately, the state um, has deleted the 1.5 million, eliminated that at the end of the budget this spring. So we're going to see what's going to happen come come. January and uh, on the national front, um, Congress is back in session for three, three weeks, and uh, we're going to be starting again with some legal and, and advocacy, Title IX, student privacy legislation, FCC, full funding, IDA, K and K twelve, um, K twelve uh, wages for for teachers. So um, so that's where we are. So it's going to be a very busy fall. It's going to go by very quickly, but. Um, it, it, you know, we're starting early as we always try to and move along. So um, I'll keep you abreast with what's happening all the fronts. Let me just interject for a second. Just want to introduce Macy Getz, our student rep. Oh, yes. Just thanks for joining us. Running Appreciate right off the field. Hey, Hi, sorry. Busy yeah. coming from field hockey. No, no, no. Congratulations. Yeah. I was over oh, there. Thank you so Big much. Win. Yeah, first home game. So. Awesome. <laughs> so thank you so much. Yeah. Sorry. No problem. No, we'll keep going. We're not next year. We're good. We'll keep going. I'm also right now. Thanks, Tara. I am nothing right now. Great to be back. Absolutely. More later. Awesome. More later. Mm -hmm. This is Neil's favorite meeting. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I wanted to report that the Simsbury Fire Marshal's Office did annual inspections in all seven schools in August and was accompanied by our supervisor of maintenance and all issues were corrected prior to the opening of school. Great. That's always good news. <laughs> Katie, anything for us? I'm awesome. I told you, I'm still calling on you. Uh, anything for us today? Um, I have a few reports from the elementary schools. Let me just We can come back to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. No. Uh, um, Thank you so much. I just wanted to welcome everybody back. Um, it was everything but a vacation over the summer. If you knew what was happening up in this office, um, I just I want to thank all of you for what you did over the summer. It was you guys worked harder than I've seen. I mean, just certainly worked harder than I thought I was going. <laughs> so um, you had lots of meetings on lots of big issues that have been set out. Uh, before us that we've all talked about as a board and I appreciate you all taking it seriously and, and doing everything and we, uh, we obviously tried to have a we we're gonna planning on having a meeting over the summer but that got pushed back for reasons I think we'll get into later but um, just appreciate all the work you all did over the summer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so from the elementary schools, the middle school, high school, um, all the elementary schools have begun their encouraging words campaign and had their back to school assemblies. Um, specifically at two in, Ms. Belmonte kicked off the school's theme of we're better together and had their assembly. Central's having their PTO sponsored welcome back picnic on Thursday. Um, Latimer Lane, they're hosting a public building committee um, for their monthly meeting, including a tour on Monday night. Um, and then they had, and then Terrafell had a welcome back picnic for all their families and open houses this week. And Squadron Lines Curriculum Night for three through six. It was on September fifth, and K through second is this Thursday. And then for the high school, the fall sports are all <laughs> full swing. Um, students are doing well with new cell phone policies. Spirit Weeks the twenty third, the twenty seventh, and our Spirit Rallies are coming up. And we also introduced our students and staff to the new SRO, um, Officer Chris Sheehan. Can I ask you a quick, just, I, I, I'm glad you brought up the cell phone policy. I mean, how, it has the reaction, anybody pushing back at all? Are people seem to be okay with what's going on? Um, I mean, from what I see, no one's really pushing Good. back. I think, you know, the reaction's more like, oh, when, how long is this going to last? When are the teachers <laughs> going to forget about it? Okay. But the teachers you know, seem to be count, counting, you know, taking attendance to be all of our numbers. So it seems to be running smoothly. I haven't seen any Right. Good. Good. Like good. No, good. Good. Yeah. I think we're uh, we're good to start. Yeah. Awesome. A lot of information to share about awesome. the opening. Yep. Great. 
And let me just say again, I'll applaud you guys. That complication was phenomenal. First of all, we need pictures of our beloved superintendent riding in on a horse. But, I have one. Uh, <laughs> see, see one <laughs> um, but really, really well done. A lot of energy. That was great. But anyways, uh, first item on the agenda is the approval of our June 11th meeting minutes. Can I get a motion? I'll make a motion to okay. approve the minutes from June 11th. Thank you. Second? Second. Great. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. I'll abstain because I wasn't okay. there. Two abstentions. Personnel. Yeah, always uh, significant at this time of year as we catch up with um, summer resignations. So well, that's where we'll begin for, uh, for your action. Um, six resignations over the course of the summer. I'll try to categorize them for you. Um, Bill Antonitis, our English department supervisor at Henry James, actually took an administrative position in another district. So congratulations to Bill. Um, Kelly Delera, who has been an art teacher with us at Tooten Hills um, for a number of years, 14 years, um, has things going on in her personal life that's going to require her to take a step back from teaching for right now. And Amy Joyce, who's been with us just two and a half years, um, gave birth to her first child, so she has decided that that's going to be her work for a little while and not teaching. Um, Beck Levine, Melissa Nimmo, and Aaron Szymanski are teachers who have just been with us for a couple of years, and these are all um, folks who took other jobs, quite frankly, closer to where they reside. So the motion is there to kind of cover the whole thing with all the dates. I'll move, I'll move that the Board of Education accept the resignation of William Antonitis and Kelly Delera, effective June 30, 2024. Amy Joyce, effective June 16, 2024. Rebecca Levine, effective July 1, 2024. Melissa Nimno, Nimmo, effective July 31st, 2024. And Aaron Szymanski, effective September 2024. Second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right, and one more that requires your action, which is um, the clause in the teacher's contract that allows them to give us advanced notice of their retirement up to three years out. So Sharon Gagan, who has been a teacher at Henry James for the past 22 years, first as a health teacher, now as a family and consumer science teacher, um, is looking to set that retirement date at the end of the 2027 school year. Um, I will say it's been 22 years in Simsbury. Sharon tells me it's been 40 overall. <laughs> so, um, but she says she's got three more in her. So, <laughs> wow. her. There, here we go. And uh, Legendary. <laughs> yeah, the motion is there for your consideration. I move that the Board of Education accept the notice of intent to retire from Sharon Gill, um, effective June 30th, 2027. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. And then I'll just point your attention to the rest of the um, exhibit. I'll be making some more comments about our new teachers. Um, you don't have to vote, vote to um, appoint teachers um, by your bylaws. So you can see um, five of our seven schools uh, added new faculty. We didn't have any at Terrapil or Latimer Lane this year. But... Um, you know, the, the list is there for um, your consideration, and I'll um, make some other comments about our new teachers when we go to the opening report. So. Yes, I meant to ask you, just since those, uh, the resignations, the yes. six resignations uh, were effective uh, after the school year, and late, late, in the year, late in the planning year, right? Yeah. Just any any issues filling? So, the yeah, we, got, any of that we got four of the six okay. filled. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have filled a uh, one of the speech and language positions that you see on here. Um, we don't have the teacher in district yet because when you hire in August, another district can actually hold the teacher for the start of the school year. So we're using a substitute teacher until that person arrives. And I'm still looking for another speech and language pathologist. So if you know anybody out there, <laughs> send them my way. Thank you. 
So one vacancy out of all the certified. That's great. Appreciate that. Uh, review and approval of the 25-26 school calendar. Yep, that's over to me. So even though we're just at the beginning of 24-25, we always approve the next school calendar a year in advance. So you do have a calendar there for your consideration for 25-26. It was prepared in accordance to state guidelines, to uh, our BOE school calendar policies, um, our union contractual working days, and we still refer back to the committee around calendar advisory. Carrie, you're very familiar with that from 2009 and their recommendations. So it's in alignment with that and a format for which you are familiar. So there is a motion there for your consideration. <laughs> um, I make the motion to accept, to adopt the 2025-2026 school calendar as presented. Is there a second? I'll second that. Um, Knowing that Tara would love to reconvene that that committee <laughs> any time. I, I really would not. Thank you. It's <laughs> a long recess. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, next up is the gift from the Central School PTO. Yes, there's actually three gifts for your consideration tonight. The first one from Central School PTO. So just as a reminder, any gift that exceeds $1,500 uh, requires your vote and consideration. So this first gift is a gift for new tables and seating. You'll actually see a picture of some of that later in the presentation of the opening schools report, but it was for the Central School Library Media Center. So there is a motion there for your consideration and the gift is from Central School's parent teacher organization. I move the proposed gift of $9,100 to Central School by the Central School Parent Teacher Organization be approved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Absolutely. That's, That's fantastic. fantastic. Definitely a need that we're very grateful to be filled. Yeah. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Uh, next up is the second gift is relative to Terrell School. So Lawrence Paul White is making a donation of $3,430 to purchase new basketball backboards for the playground that were severely damaged and created a kind of a safety concern. So uh, there's a generous donation for your consideration. Move that the proposed gift of $3,430 to Terrebil School by Lawrence Paul White be approved. And thank you so much to him. It's great. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any damage in the storm? Is that what happened? No, no. use. No, I just well, Age. 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 Yeah. Age. Okay. And then the final gift is for Tuton Hill School from their PTO. It's a gift in the amount of $7,249 to offset the cost of the schedule field trip. Move that the proposed gift of $7,249 from Tuton Hill's PTO be approved. Second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I just want to take a second here. This is yeah. mm -hmm. roughly uh, $20,000 that was just donated to us. I just want to make sure we convey that we appreciate it. We, un we, we It is uh, not taken for granted. Um, and that is, that is just fantastic. So with all our thanks. And the nice part, it was all for three different schools right. and three different... Um, areas yeah. that were well needed. Yeah. Great. The uh, yeah. school opening report. Yeah, so we have an opportunity tonight just to kind of hit on several key uh, areas of our opening. So Sue is going to facilitate the first part of that. Um, we we'll talk a little bit about new teacher orientation. We we'll talk about some of our recent achievement data, which we're really excited about. Very excited. And. Uh, 
Leo's going to talk about some personnel and a bunch of other information, some of the improvements we've made with building and grounds, but kind of a, a catch-all catch-up of how we kick off the year. All right? Yeah. Try tag team here. Yeah. So from the Office of Teaching and Learning, uh, people were asking for pictures of convocation, and here are a smattering. Mm -hmm. uh, convocation took a very fun well, theme <laughs> around continuation of the Olympics. And how are we going to carry the torch of excellence um, as we continue to go for the gold here in Simsbury? So um, a host of different speakers, certainly Diane, I don't know if there was a picture of her there in the, in the Trojan head, um, but very much a spirit rally in games, but with a serious intent about community and what we're all about. Um, I have to give all the credit to Neil, but we are talking about, hey, how do we symbolically have teachers carry the torch of excellence back to their schools? And he thought of a great idea. I'm not going to steal all your thunder. I didn't know I had any thunder, but... <laughs> I just gave some to you. Um, so we, in the personnel office, looked up the teacher in each school who had served the greatest number of years in the Simsbury Public Schools and they got to carry out a torch to lead their school back to. So some of our very, very veteran teachers, and it was very well received. It was great. The way to kick off, we all received multiple comments walking around the schools the first weeks, and just that it was a very uplifting, high-energy, focused convocation. So it was a great way to kick off. So as we always do, we orient our goals and priorities for the year in our strategic plan. And I always set these up in the three specific goal areas of student growth and success, our compassionate and caring school culture, and our premier workforce. So I'm going to discuss more around achievement. Um, we look at the student achievement of all students and groups and grades and schools. So I'm going to give you a highlight of that. And as you know from spring updates, uh, we've had some curricular shifts at the elementary, right? Looking at new math materials, looking at the science of reading and legislative requirements around our reading approaches. So that will certainly be an area of focus. And as members of the curriculum committee know, very uh, glad that we have reinstituted a consistent curricular cycle of review. And we look at different content areas from a K-12 perspective. We look at three in any given year. And this year up for review is math, PE, physical education and wellness, as well as uh, our library media, specifically our technology scope and sequence. So you'll be hearing more about that area in board meetings to come. Around our school culture, certainly you've heard a couple of times around our encouraging words and how do we approach all people with respect and kindness in our interactions and how we just go about our daily business. So that's very much a part of our school culture focus as well as our tiered intervention of support. So how do we know when students aren't hitting those um, marks of meeting or exceeding expectations yet? And what do we do about it to make sure that they are supported academically, behaviorally, socially? And then finally, premier workforce. As you know, legislative requirements um, started a ball rolling around educator evaluation. Neil and I presented the plan to the board last spring, and we have been working very hard over the summer to make sure that teachers are ready to go, and that administrators are ready to go, and that we are looking at areas where teachers are passionate about instruction, about assessment, about students, and really making sure that we are providing quality feedback to them and supporting their professional growth and teamwork. So you'll be hearing more about these themes, again, linked to our strategic plan, but I always like to set the stage of teaching and learning in that for you. So on to some student learning data, just as a way to orient the board to what are we going to be talking about 
A reminder that we provide standardized assessments to students in grades three through eight and also specifically grade 11. So in our grades three through eight, we're talking about the Smarter Balanced Assessment, SBA. We drop the C of consortium, so it's SBA. I don't really like the way it sounds, but it is what it is. And then in grades five, eight, and 11, we assess relative to our next generation science standards. So you'll be hearing about more data relative to student performance in those grade levels. And then of course for grade 11, it's the Scholastic Aptitude Test or the SAT. So I'm gonna break down some of those results for you this evening and give you the opportunity to kind of ask any questions. Certainly as uh, the high school and the middle school and elementary, um, look at their or provide their reports to the board of ed you'll be getting some more details so this is meant to be kind of a higher look at where we're where we performed and where we're going um, so I'm giving the ESPA data to you in two content areas both in English language arts and in math and I'm doing kind of a composite roll-up of our elementary and then our middle school so the percentages represent the percentage of students who are at or above what we require as achieving the benchmark, okay? So for grades three through six, you can see that we are um, well positioned with rankings in our DERG of number two and number three of ELA and math. Uh, ranks in the elementary level are climbing and there's some good news. It's a correlation. I always say correlation does not imply causation. However, there is a strong correlation with those classrooms that participated in our Think Math pilot and this math performance. We looked at it to a T. So we're really excited about that. Um, in the middle school, you'll also see the roll up for both ELA and math. Uh, Mr. Baker will certainly be commenting more of Upon that performance, certainly we're not where we want to be. Um, the kind of linked in and aligned news is that our instructional focus at Henry James this year is around digging into math. And as I just shared, we have a math curriculum review. So we are already working with the math leaders and the math department, um, as well as the ELA department to say, all right, where can we do better and how are we getting after that instructional? So certainly more details to come, but that work is well underway. One shift we had talked about at the board and we had gotten away from a little bit post-COVID is doing a much more, you know, we've been going out to the individual schools and elementary schools will give us highlights, but do a much more comprehensive overview of the elementary kind of data and performance. So we'll plan to do that with um, Betsy after the Henry James report uh, comes in because we have some really interesting things to share. I think when you get into individual grades, uh, and looking at some of that data, particularly the early grades that are assessed uh, with some of the shifts we've made, that achievement level comparatively to other districts is much higher than it has been. So the foundation now should be stronger uh, moving forward with some of the shifts. So we're kind of excited about that. I know I'm jumping ahead and I know we're only in week two of the school year, but <laughs> obviously those rankings for the middle school aren't what we're typically used to. Yes. Um, can, can you give us a preview, like what, what are we looking at what's the focus so we can climb back up? Um, our specific focus is our instructional practices in our non-honors math classes. And that's where we're seeing where we have to do better with our data and how are we responding when kids aren't hitting those markers yet and what are those best practices. So that's where we're really zeroing in our attention. I think in particular that seventh grade cohort moving to eighth grade. The sixth grade cohort coming up, yeah. performance was very strong uh, overall in the dirt. I think it was second in the dirt. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, yes, it was second in the dirt. So, so, so we got to make sure we're moving yeah. forward, holding yeah. and moving forward. You know, there'll be quite a bit to talk about and look at there. So, again, I'm, I'm sorry to keep poking at this a little no. bit, but so it feels like the if, if what you're saying, so the, the in the honors, so if you're a high performer, you're fine. You're still performing. Yeah, you're still performing. I'm assuming if, if you're at the lower end of that spectrum, you're probably getting the attention you need. So I'm assuming we're probably talking about sort of that student population kind of right in the middle then. Yeah, and I think, say, I, yes, and I think when we look at that data, there is a 
pretty um, developed group that are right at the fringe of hitting that marker of being at what we would consider our benchmark. So it's paying some close attention to that. What are some smaller adjustments that we can make to ensure they get over that goal line? And then what does that instruction look like for all so we can make some growth movements that we just didn't actualize as much? Do you have the comparable data to of this exact from to last year? I do as far as the ranks. Yeah, at the ranks. And I would just be curious, like, it's interesting, like, what those numbers look like for last year, if there, that sixth grade moving, like, how did sixth grade do last year? And, like, why? It just seems much lower seems than it was low. than it was in years past. Yeah, it so. was. So we had a stronger cohort move to the high school, mm -hmm. right? And we dropped about five percentage points in math overall when we look at the seventh and eighth grade. Um, and we know in the middle school that there is quick turnover of those two grades. So to Matt's point, that sixth grade cohort, which is now seventh, is going to be strong. That said, we still have some work to do to say, where are our students not actualizing the skills that we want them to actualize? And really digging in deep there. In a, in and what are they missing going into high school? And are the high school teachers ready for it? And and arguably, it's not just a math issue, though. I mean, ELA yeah. does reflect well. No, that's right. yeah. we're usually higher there too. Oh. We, when we're comparing these numbers to other uh, districts, are 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 they say grade to grade or middle school to middle school? Like, because other districts have sixth grade or even fifth grade in their middle schools, right? So. That's a great question. So we have to tease out which middle schools are five through eight constructs versus six through eight and really go more of a grade by grade comparison, which makes the comparison a little bit tougher, right? Than if you're looking at, you know, pretty consistent three through six performance mm -hmm. or one grade level for SAT, which we'll get to in a second at grade 11. So we attribute for that. We just don't do middle school by middle school, but more grade by grade within those middle schools in the dark. So I don't want to bring up a touchy Same. conversation, but or top topic, but years like when I first joined the board, there was the talk of the sixth grade. And it's kind of been like lingering moving up from hasn't happened for various reasons, right? I wonder just if that would help. Like if that would help. A larger continuum. A larger contingent, longer time in middle school, more reason. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, it's one of the, you know, put it out, it's one of the areas that you wanted our administration to refocus on, right, and, and talk through. So we actually have a meeting with Tecton on uh, Friday, you know, to, to pull some of the schematic back out and organize the information and think about what type of conversations we would want to have with who and where to bring that back to the forefront in terms of a capital focus. Yeah. Yeah. Um, quick question. Can we see this data broken down, like seventh and eighth, for example, seventh grade and eighth grade? One hundred percent. And then also in the elementary schools, are you note are these consistent numbers across the five or are you noticing differences among the five? So can I answer that one? Of course you can. Elementary is pretty consistent. There's a few variances, and that's the report we're going to bring to you later on. Like, I really want you to see what those details are and those strengths. I mean, I have it all right here. I can get it to you in, my, in, in the Friday update pretty easily. Um, but I, I think of the 17 markers overall across the elementary schools, we're within the top five in, in 13 out of the seven. Uh, 17. So it's pretty um, it's pretty consistent. There's a few that are lower. Science is a little lower that we'll see. Um, but the, um, the early grades, particularly third grade, like in literacy, we've always struggled there a little bit. Um, much better performance now with some of the recent kind of changes we've made. And the supports, because some of these kids, yeah. it's all the transition from the years they missed. So, but we have all that data. Um, and when is the test given? I can't remember. Is it spring? There's a window in the spring. spring. Yes. Um, my next question is relating to the SAT, so go ahead. Right. We'll hit science first. Just to one thing on, on that. Yes, Jeff. They already kind of hit on it, so I do think it'll be important, right, to see like that breakdown of 
seven and eight, but also like maybe two years back, a year back. Yeah. And that's right. Like, what's this trend going on, right? And in all transparency, like my son's in that seventh going into eighth grade group. So I, I kind of, this doesn't really surprise me too much. So I know it's something that's like they were focusing on as well. So I do think it'd be interesting to see like, where were we? Was there a dip? Are we bouncing back? Like, was this like a train was coming down the track or was something going on? So, so we'll I put that, yeah. we'll make all that a part of Scott's report. Yep, great. Yep. Thank you. My name is Scott's report. We, second meeting in October. October. Second meeting in October. Okay. So science, grades 5, 8, and 11. So again, you'll see the at or above benchmark and the DERC ranking. So, um, you know, as Matt alluded to, we're not where we want to be in science. Uh, we have already pulled together our science team to take a look at what are we currently doing? What are the units of study? How is that taught? It's not taught with as many instructional minutes as your ELA in math. It's just how it lives. Social studies is the same way. But with the instructional time that we do have, how are we maximizing that to teach into these skills? The nice trends that we... You're talking about fifth grade. Specific. Fifth grade. Yeah. What we usually see in eighth grade is better performance, which we see here. So about 75% of our students are at above grade level here with a DERG ranking of fourth. So that's also encouraging. And that makes sense because when students are coming to the middle school, they have science every single day. Um, and then in 11th grade, we're really proud of that science performance first in the DERG. And that's been pretty consistent. We've been like one, two, one, and um, we're really excited that we're ranked first in our DERG. So, that's great. You know, we're continuously, specifically at the middle and high school, looking at the alignment of curriculum, making sure that we are addressing the standards, addressing the performance expectations. So more to come on that. That's great. Can I ask another thing on that? Could we, for the Friday report, can we see, like, how was grade 11 alone when they took it the fifth and eighth and then eighth? How were they at fifth? Mm -hmm. And then, because it's kind of, I mean, it's interesting, but it's because it's different students, mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know? Yeah. How you want to see how that cohort yeah. performed? Correct. Okay. Yeah, some nice context to these numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So in the SAT very excited about our SAT performance. So in both uh, ELA and math, rank in DERG, for the our DERG ranking of one in ELA and ranking of two in math. So these at or above scores, um, these are based upon a, a measure that the college board says this is what it means to be college ready. So this is a college ready measurement. Um, for ELA, we've seen a, a significant climb of about th uh, five percentage points. And again, these are based upon the this year's graduating class who took the SAT school day last year. Um, and then for math, that dirt ranking. So I do want to point out that between one and two for math, it was 0.6. Of a percent. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's wow. Wow. so is that reading that right? So if we rank second in math, but only sixty percent of our yeah. students are it's interesting for that's context. a bigger problem. Yeah. I pull yeah. I pull so <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. So before we came in, I pulled the you know, what's the state marker on that, just yeah. to give some context, right? So, you know, we're 85% ELA, the state's 55. Yeah. 60 in math, the state's 29. What? So the spread it's, between it's each is the same, but the overall performance. I also want to note that college readiness score, maths is higher. Yeah. Okay, so, so math, you have to achieve charts. a math score of 530 in order to hit that benchmark, where your ELA is 480. Yeah. So that's part of the discrepancy as well. Not all of it, but part which is, of it. Which is a state-driven data point. Yeah. But it makes you want to dig deeper into that a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But we are very happy with how we are performing with. comparative to yeah. other districts. So exciting news. And more details to come in those school reports.
Over to you, Mr. Sullivan. All right, am I taking that? Yes, sir. First in the high school in ELA, science and second in math. Mm -hmm. it hasn't been like that in a long time. Since when? Uh, <laughs> 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 so, that's what he's trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just had to get that in. <laughs> you asked. Uh, if you think the convocation had a lot of energy and juice, you should have been here the week before when Miss Lumpy and I kicked off new teacher orientation with um, 20, that they're not all in the picture, but 20 fantastic um, new educators uh, to Simsbury. Here's where they're still looking fresh and excited <laughs> on their first day um, in Simsbury. They're um, still looking like that. Let's take another picture today. No, they're um, still looking like that. First year's tough, but they're, they're, they're all... <laughs> They are doing great, um, and it was obviously we start the process. I think I signed the first contract. Um, interviews usually start right after April vacation, so I think I signed the first one to a contract in um, early May, and you know up until the first day of new teacher orientation that we're in that process. This year's cohort of about 20 new teachers is what I've typically seen. We've had in the last two years more like 35 teachers as new teachers, um, and, and that is um, similar to the trend of the state, that there was just more hiring happening in the last two years, more re resignations from teaching force. So that represents um, a little bit more than 5% of the teaching staff when you say 20, that that is um, a, a pretty good number. So. Uh, obviously, uh, the details about each of those are in that personnel report that I uh, walked you through. Um, here's how we yeah, – go ahead. I was curious. I was looking at that when we were going through. There's some, right, with zero experience to be expected, but there's, there's a good amount with experience coming in. Just curious, over the past, say, three, four years, when you're out there trying to get replacements, get hires, are you seeing anything reputationally, trends, anything – Simsbury in general, is it getting easier, harder, or people gravitating? Like, what's kind of just out of curiosity from our perspective? When you're out there trying to fill a role, what's kind of the vibe of coming to Simsbury? Yeah. So I'll skip okay. through to this because this is a slide. So this is to have two-thirds of the teachers that we hired this year be zero to five years of experience. That's a little higher than typical. Um, we, we have... Um, you know, certainly, with the, as we went through a tough budget in the spring, you're mindful of that as you go into like hire for new teachers because you do, it is one of the only ways to control cost around your personnel. Like as uh, and we talk about that during the budget process that we budget for not hiring a top of the scale teacher. That's not to say that we don't do it sometimes. You know, if a if a top of the scale speech and language pathologist walked in tomorrow and I have a vacancy, I'm probably going to be more interested um, because I I can't fill that position. Where where there are some positions that are still attracting enough pool. Like if you put an elementary teaching position out there, you will have plenty of very strong candidates who are less than five years of experience. When you get to the secondary level, that's true in some disciplines. You could find plenty of social studies teachers, plenty of English teachers. You wouldn't find as many new science teachers, math teachers. They're harder to find. So the pools differ. Um, and um, there's been a significant turnover. I mean, a lot of the positions you'll notice are special ed positions. So across, we are tending to find um, special ed teachers that we are hiring with a few years of experience in another district, and then they come here. Um, and and um, usually, there's two things that those of you who have done negotiations with us know. Our salary schedule is okay, but in Simsbury, you tend to get to the top of the salary schedule a little faster than you do in other districts. So it is advantageous for teachers who have a few years in to try to come to Simsbury and they'll get to a, not right away, but they'll get to a higher wage faster in their career. 
Um, so this is by um, experience what we were seeing this year in terms of um, what was coming in. I will say this. Um, Ten years ago when I started in this position, like the, the recruiting fairs were a really important way to go out there. They've become less important. Just not COVID really. They weren't happening during COVID, and they haven't recovered. Like the only one that really had uh, UConn's fair kind of got back to where it had been this year, but the others are still struggling. Like at Central Connecticut, there were not a lot of people at the fair. Um, we have a minority recruiting fair. There were not a lot of people there. So there's that methodology. I think it's something that personnel directors need to think about because it's just not how people are looking for their jobs anymore. Yeah, I think, thank you, Neil. That's kind of what I was thinking you were going to be getting at. And I would just say, right, early first meeting, but, you know, budget, all that, whoever needs to hear it out there, right? The things we've talked about going in, right, now the numbers are right. We talked about special ed, workloads, burnout, turnover, right? If you're starting to see a budget, 67%, zero to five, right? So they're saying things, and but then there's the proofs in the pudding, right? Who's coming? Who are we getting? What are we seeing, right? These aren't opinions. These are facts. So just kind of putting that out there yeah. like early on. And then this slide shows you um, we are seeing more. We used to hire a lot of brand new teachers with just a bachelor's degree. They, stand, they tend now, many of them, to stay and have a master's degree even before they take their first teaching job. There's a lot of like five year programs to get a master's of ed before you even go look for that first job. And I would say that puts them into a different column on the uh, quite a few. Almost everybody in special ed kind of gets. They, they earn a degree and then they get another master's degree in special education even before they come in. So that's that's what that one is showing. Um, I'm going to go backwards because I skipped new teacher orientation. So um, we do it at, at uh, the nice library space at um, Henry James. It's been a great place to hold it for the last few years. Um, and we feed them a lot. The feedback about the food is always excellent. Um, and uh, we, we have upped our game in terms of the swag that they get so that when they walk in on the first day of school, they could be wearing a nice Simsbury polo um, and have their Simsbury coffee mug that they're drinking out of. So um, we are very happy to bring back some of the teachers who sat in their seat the year before who were new teachers the year before they come in and talk to this cohort of new teachers and that's always a highlight of the first morning um, we run a number of sessions um, sue um, does a guide guiding activity through the vision of the graduate as a foundational document that's going to be um, a big part of what they have to prepare for in simsbury taya um, and um, a teacher from Tooton hills school do uh, an equity presentation. Katie Crisula does a special education um, session, uh, and Dave Princeton gets them their new technology and kind of walks them through it. Uh, they also have orientations at their buildings and kind of a curriculum overview with a department supervisor or at the elementary level, sort of Betsy's team. So over the course of three days, they most of it's two days, then we take um, anybody who's in their first two years of teaching also has to do TEAM, which is the statewide induction program for new teachers. And uh, Jan Sands, our TEAM facilitator, does a morning, does another morning with those folks. And we actually started last year with letting them get through the third day. They have an opportunity to come back, get a final lunch, and then we just open it up to, all right, you've had a lot over three days, what's still on your mind? And we're really happy with what we're getting out of that final session to make sure that they're, you know, and they really feed, off, this group fed off of each other. Um, and um, of course, we end, I should always say, we end the first day with the cultural tour of Simsbury, which is on the Salters air conditioned bus. <laughs> We hit every corner of Simsbury and finish at uh, Tall Meadow, 
uh, we can invite you next year if you want. Nobody's <laughs> taken any up on it, but we hit a, I, I'm now referring to it as the cultural tour. It's been called things and other things in the past. <laughs> Neil, I have a question. Yes. You said you brought back a cohort from last year um, to meet with the new group. What are just some of the questions that, that they were asking or the new? Yeah, we bring back three teachers. We bring back one, like an elementary, middle, and high school, and they are a little panel. Um, you know, certainly they, um, we, we do an activity where before that we're talking about PLCs, professional learning communities. So they'll ask like, what, what does it really look like? They'll, they ask a lot about how did you get supported in your first year of teaching? Like they want to know who to turn to. Um, what would you have done differently in your first yeah. year? What do you think are the things that will set us up for the best success as a teacher, as a, you know, an educator here for a really long time? Yeah. Um, but very thoughtful, reflective, genuine questions. Yeah. Of, there will always be a question or two about like how, what things do you do to make sure you're reaching out to parents? Like, what do I want to do? What do I not want to do? Um, so it's always we get we we do that. It's about a forty-five minute thing that they get to ask questions. It's great. Right. Is there anything that surprised you for year to year? Anything that's jumped out between some of their questions or, or comments and things or thoughts? I, I not nothing comes to mind this year. I mean, no. And we we ask them for their feedback and a in a survey. They could fill that out anonymously or not it's their choice and that's what we use to make improvements on the next year and very very positive feedback yeah the, th the three days are they we do it on tuesday wednesday and thursday of the week before school then if they want to just come in friday and be like in their school in their room getting set up it's an optional day but a lot of them do it and then they come back in on Monday for convocation and they feel ready. All right, so that's sort of our new teacher piece, busy summer, uh, bringing in 20 great new educators and one to go. Um, and just, of course, you'll get my full October explanation, but I wanted to let you know where we are with enrollment. So you can see um, overall from the last year, Last year in the middle column, 4104 was our district K-12 count, and we are 35 students less than that so far this year. This will, that number will change by October 1st. It'll go up and down or down by maybe five students, but it will change somewhat. But on that first Friday, August 30th, when we took the count, we were at 4,069. Remarkably, almost exactly what it was two years ago when we were 4,064. You can see um, it is uh, virtually identical at the K-6 level. I will say a um, couple of interesting things. You'll remember that our last budget cut um, to get to whatever number that we had set was that we were going to try to only keep three first grades at Latimer Lane and um, not hire a new teacher there, which had been originally budgeted. We didn't make it. We had to, we had enough move-ins that we did have to hire a new teacher. But based on the savings of the other teachers that we had hired at Lower, like there was within budget to be able to do that. So we actually, even though it breaks that you have 20, is it 26? I can't read it for me. 26 fewer elementary students from last year to this. You have one more teacher, just by the way it broke in the various schools. Um, and um, that's with the TV teacher going over. Here. And yeah, if there's one more, there's an additional teacher. Uh, yep. And the other interesting thing that we did, we watched kindergarten all summer long. Um, and we were seeing very low kindergarten numbers, extremely low at Terrafil, and it ended up at the end of the day that there were only 21 kindergartners in all of Terrafil school, and Squadron Line was pushing over into the 90s. So we actually, in late August, Terrafil is running one kindergarten section, and we moved 
a teacher to squadron line to give them a fifth kindergarten and make the class size. So it's how, you know, it's a proper use of the resources by your class size guidelines. And we'll have to, you know, hopefully, I mean, I would like to see some move-ins and, you know, I'd like to get back to two first grades at Terrafield, but we'll have to see what that cohort does. Do we have the room at squadron for that extra? It's and tight. Extra K class. I mean, that it's what they. It's, it's uh, we moved a we moved a preschool room. We moved some preschool to Latimer. Oh, okay. So we moved the preschool to Latimer and opened up the pre K for yeah. the additional K. Squadron has several grades with five sections. Four, four grades. I, I definitely have a few comments and questions about the Terrible thing, and so I don't know if you just want to wait till at ten one. Sure. Or. Once we yeah. have the numbers, just because I, I just want to understand how we went, and knowing that, and knowing squadrons already over, like, did we consider like offering the parents to move, or how would you do it? And you know, I, and it brings me to a bigger question of, and we can talk about this at ten one, yeah. but that like for schools like Central or Squadron or Latimer that might have a difference, you know, like. A grade three is four classes, and then the grade four is five classes. How do they manage that teacher-wise every elementary year? And yeah, we can certainly mm -hmm. talk about that. Um, I what I can tell you about the um, Terrafil Squadron. I mean, we made a decision that Squadron needed a fifth at the time. Terrafil was. Um, I think we did it on the first week of uh, August. And at the time, Terrafil was running with 20 students. And so we said, Section. hey, we're going to move it over to Squadron. If it ends up that we need another teacher at Terrafil, we'll hire it. Like, we'll hire a new teacher. So we were always prepared if that number did grow from 20 to something above class size guidelines, that just like we did at Latimer, we would add a new teacher. Now, over the last, I mean, we're now over four weeks since we made that decision and only one kindergartner got added. So it's been, it, it rode uh, high teens all spring, then it settled at 20 all summer long and we made a decision. But yeah, we don't, we have not like said, hey, do you want, like opening it up to parents, do you want to go? That was not something we really considered. And do we ever consider that? It's just because, like, we we're that. talking four or five kids no. would have allowed for two classes, and some people at Squadron well, it would, like, it would no, allow two, it would have allowed for, for two th sessions. Very small classes at Terraville and still very large classes at Squadron. Well, you're going to have very large classes at Squadron no matter what. So four or five no, kids actually, out of there. They're actually they're about eighteen good. each. They're pretty good. So we, we did consider it once. It was very late in the season. It's when we had no compa uh, capacity. Yeah. Um, and we got no takers that late in the game to, to try to do it. It's yeah. a lot for a kid, too. It was a, I think it was a Parents. central, central tariff hill situation. But. We have had tariff hill at central a lot. So we can talk more about it at the. Yeah, 10 one. I'm the, Yeah, and I'll certainly bring all of that. And, um, so that was my elementary comment. You can see we're actually 683 at the middle school. That's the largest our middle school has been in quite some time. Um, that's three full teams at each grade level. So a little bit of a build up at the middle school again. Um, and what that, why that happened is because of very small class from eighth to ninth grade. So that's why you can see a high school number that's actually almost 60 less than last year. There's, uh, I think, as of this October, uh, this August 30th, the freshman class, I believe the number was only 275 students. Wow. What is it typically? More like 330. Wow. Yeah, so it's a small group. And that's why that overall high school number is down. And you'll recall from the budget process, we went, we were sort of in a uh, teachers went from the high school to the middle school to deal with this expected. So we have a number of teachers who were high school teachers, but now they're teaching two classes at the middle school to deal with this enrollment. So um, can I see a quick question? Sure. So 
go back. So for at least the last couple of years, right, we've been preaching enrollment is going up, going up. And that, you know, we're using that as part of the reason for our capacity. So obviously, we're down, whatever that is, 50. I guess, and I can... We got 35 from 30, last year. 30. Yeah. Oh, I did the math class. Um, so 35 from last year, which obviously is not terrible, but it's still down, right? Are you seeing, and I, I can explain the bubble, I get the bubble, that, that's, are you seeing the increase in the lower grades? And, and why I'm asking that is because, right, if, if it is, if, if you're seeing more of an increase in the lower grades, that number kind of takes care of itself, okay. right, as, that, as those groups rise. So I think it's prohibitive right now. Here's my theory. The, um, especially in Simsbury, couples who are with children under five years of age are being priced out of homes here. And I think it's harder for young families to find that first home in Simsbury. So I think that is, um, while the real estate market heated up, we did not get a ton of registrations in here this summer because I just don't think young families were moving in. And that is also from some of those teachers you saw that I hired. I would talk to them uh -huh. and they were like, I'm not going to be able to afford to live here for a while. Like that's and you have the kindergarten legislation. Yeah. yeah. That we talked oh, yeah. a great deal that's about true. that the that's kindergarten true. cohort yeah. would have looked very different yeah. had that legislation not gone right. Which so would have attributed for you would have been more so of a flat. So you see a, we'll see a, will you see that bump next we'll year? We'll see a jump. But we don't know. I, I haven't yeah, looked at I mean, the I know that's premature. Yeah, yeah, no. I mean, and this number is lower than the projection, and I'll show you all that on October's report. Um, and I lowered NESDEC's projection. So this is below the projection that I had already adjusted. So if we had gone with NESDEC's number, this would have been way off. So it's an interesting topic, and it will certainly yeah. come yeah. up during our budget. Yeah, it's about to show that projecting down the road is almost next to impossible. It's tough. It's tough. Once the trend gets gets bumped, who's having babies? It's just a tough thing to predict. Oh, I can't wait for October 1st. <laughs> <laughs> it is your favorite. She and Neil, man, give you, your favorite I meeting. I love that one. I give you just enough <laughs> to let your head. Teaser. <laughs> Big teasers. <laughs> Still to come. I can't wait. All right. I have one more question to add yes. to our list for to two. Um, on our the scores and uh, such, could we see the third grade, last year's third grade testing? Mm -hmm. I'd be curious because A, I believe they are smaller group, and B, they are the COVID babies or the kindergarten COVID kids. And so I'd be curious how they did comparatively. Third grade performance? Yeah. Third grade only. So ELA. Last year's third grade. Last year's third grade. Yeah. yeah. ELA was second in the Dirk. And math was smack in the middle of the pack. Just curious, because those are the COVID kits that I wonder if there was any impact there. But we, they would be everybody's COVID kits. True. At all right. districts. You're right, you're right, you're right. 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 Compared to like <laughs> two years ago, third yeah, grade, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah, the reading's higher than that's ever been. That's, that's what we'll delve that's into a little bit. It's really we had interesting. a very specific action plan, and it actualized in the results for reading. So the current fourth graders were the COVID kindergartners. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And they did fine. All right, so to jump into facilities, uh, before I start, I did want to make an introduction. We have our new supervisor of maintenance here, Kyle Hi, nice. all good. And uh, the reason I asked him to, to come here was we had an extremely busy summer when it came to facilities. Between uh, what was funded last year, the CNR dollars were up, we had some big CIP projects. This was, at least in my own recent memory, uh, the most facility improvement projects that I've seen happen here in a single summer. And I do want to uh, point a lot of that success uh, right here towards Kyle. He did a great job. Thank you. So we'll start over at Latimer, which is starting to look like a real school. 
<laughs> the construction uh, is moving right along. The project is on budget. It's actually ahead of schedule. Uh, the instructional spaces are all online. The main office and nurses section is what's left to go. That's the under construction part. Uh, but we're expecting to have substantial completion uh, in October, towards the end of October, and hopefully a ribbon cutting ceremony sometime in November. So this is coming along great. That's great. Uh, we had our standard influx of Chromebooks. We added 965 to the fleet. Uh, for instance, our freshmen in high school all get uh, new ones and then move them through for four years. And there's other grade levels that get new ones, and there's a whole cycle of who gets what each individual year. But, uh, we've gotten this down to, I'd say, a pretty uh, solid groove now as to how this, this all works. Uh, we refreshed our copier fleet, so every four years we take out the old and bring in the new, so all of our schools have updated copiers. And we've completed our paper cut uh, printer management uh, uh, system. So this is our teachers and staff ability to print something out and walk over to one of these copiers, swipe their fob, and their job pops out. So if they go there and there's a line, they can go to the next printer and swipe it there. So it's called Follow Me Printing. Uh, the high school and Latimer were the last to come online, so now we have all seven schools uh, using that, that method. Uh, we had some security upgrades. So uh, we have a project to uh, refresh our cameras. We first started here uh, with our, with our uh, CCTV cameras Pretty much when I first started here, about 2005, 2006 was when this all started getting uh, integrated. And we've got some uh, analog cameras that are a bit long in the tooth that are being replaced with digital cameras. That project's been going on. We've also added some to uh, some school buses. So that's, that's a new uh, thing that we're, uh, we're looking at now. Uh, not all the buses, but we do have some. And we have... Uh, replaced the fob readers at the doors of all the facilities uh, that didn't have this particular type of reader. So there's four schools uh, that now have the same type of reader that the other three schools have. So from a user perspective, really no change. The fobs always work no matter which building you went to, which door. Uh, but we were managing that behind the scenes across three different software systems. So now we have one, uh, one system much easier to manage, uh, much happier about that. Is it less expensive to do it on one? Uh, it's from a maintenance standpoint, yes. The other uh, company that we were using, we had a lot of issues with. The other three schools have uh, virtually no problems once we went to them. So uh, there's going to be certainly some savings there. And to save a lot of aggravation yes. <laughs> That's by not working with that vendor anymore. Yes. Not to be named. <laughs> so this is a, a project for way down the, the line. But I'd be curious if the buses that have cameras, if you saw any change, behavior uh, changes. Mr. Salter and I, uh, I've watched some interesting video. Uh, <laughs> um, they just went in and like, April of last year, so we had a couple of months of, and um, when you can be able to say to a parent, come watch your child on the bus, it's very, it, it's potentially very helpful, but we're pretty new into it, um, but yeah, it, uh, and it picks up a lot, they're very good cameras. Do the kids know that there are cameras on the bus? Uh, they you, told? You, yes, they are told, and you see them. Yeah, they're not hidden. There are there are five buses now in the fleet that have them, and the, the interesting thing about this and working with Salter is that if we do wind up with some particular recurring issue on a bus, we can just swap the numbers on the bus, and now that's the bus that has the cameras. So, so that's true. Uh, and as I alluded to, we did do a lot of maintenance work this this summer. So uh, two roof replacements. The one at Terrafill will be wrapped up this week. There's just some flashing work that's going on. Uh, very non-disruptive stuff. Someone just putting metal flashing on the sides of the roof. Uh, similarly, uh, Central is having its uh, wrap-up happening. 
the only piece that's going to be left lingering to the end of September is the, if you go into the gym uh, at Terrafil and you look up, there's that dome, that skylight kind of dome. Uh, that's had a longer lead time to get in. So uh, towards the end of September, they're going to replace that dome. Then the roof will be done. As far as disruption, there is no disruption going down uh, roof-related. Those projects are effectively uh, wrapped up. Uh, we had a major plumbing overhaul at Two Mills. This is a sort of phase two of a three-phase uh, capital project, replacing cast iron pipes and such in that building. Uh, a lot of work was done over the summer there to accomplish that. Uh, Central, which had our some of our oldest existing wiring, so some of the old cloth-covered copper wires that you see, uh, round fuses, those types of things have been replaced with new wiring there. Uh, that project is just about done. We had one piece of equipment, uh, some gear that's coming in a little later on to wrap that up. Again, not disruptive, just to finish up the project. And then uh, lastly on this slide, some... Uh, Heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, or HVAC improvements. Uh, at where was it? at uh, the high school, Central, Terrafil, and Squadron, we were actually able to reallocate some equipment that came out of Latimer Lane just before we started uh, the renovation there. So we pulled out some AC units and heat pumps and things, and were able to do some improvements at the other schools. Uh, painting and flooring. And if, if you saw nothing else when you walked through our schools, this made a big difference. Uh, there were about 20 different locations that got paint and about 20 different locations that got new flooring. Uh, in some cases, those overlapped, but not all. Here's two pictures where they did. So that's a hallway at Squadron on the right and the library at Central on the left. Uh, the, the locations are, are looking absolutely gorgeous at this point. And last slide, upcoming. So as I said, our, our Latimer Lane renovation is still ongoing into the school year, but by uh, November we'll be having a ribbon cutting, so looking forward to that. Uh, on the docket for, for uh, planning, we're looking at adding four grass fields. If you're behind the high school where the modulars are and looking out at those fields, we're looking to put four soccer field size grass fields in that area. Uh, so we're getting pricing on that uh, right now. Uh, we've, in our six-year plan, put in for some paving improvements at uh, driveways, parking lots, sidewalks. Uh, we do have some, some crumbling paving work to, to work with, so we're going to be asking for that in the upcoming budget cycles. Uh, also, there's a new Connecticut statute regarding how often we do assessments of our HVAC systems. So the first two of those assessments are taking place now, and we expect that uh, there'll be some improvements to look at there. So those are going to be some improvements as we go. And then some other six-year capital things in development. Uh, the Tooten Hills partial roof replacement is coming up this summer. That was something that was funded last year, but it just takes time to get through the state process and, and get that working. So that's an upcoming piece. Uh, also, we're hoping to do some parking lot, playground, line striping, so striping the basketball courts and striping the, the parking spaces, uh, those kind of line drawings. Uh, the high school amphitheater, seating and flooring, is a project for uh, this coming summer. It was just a matter of the lead time on the chairs, so the seating will actually happen coming summer, although it's already funding approved. Uh, we do have two new school buses and one van on order. Uh, again, funded previously, but on order. It takes a long lead time process. Basically, by the end of this coming school year, we'll be seeing those uh, join the fleet. And then lastly, some long-term planning, which was alluded to earlier. We're starting discussions again about potential for putting the sixth grade into Henry James. And we'll see where those, those talks lead. I just wanted to point out on Latimer, I just I greatly appreciate all the work you and the entire team has done. I think two just in, two important call outs that you mentioned. One, we're coming in ahead of schedule. That is I mean, as you, anybody knows in today's construction world, that's uh, not the norm. So I greatly appreciate that. And I love what you said about taking out 
we were able to repurpose some of the, the HVAC. Uh, uh, you know. yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, in, in machinery or infra infrastructure there. That is, uh, you know, that's that's greatly appreciated, and, and, and what a great way to repurpose all that stuff. And so, uh, significant furniture redistribution yeah. to other schools. That, that's that great. Went into I mean, that just, as well. You know, we get asked a lot nice. about using tax dollars wisely, and this is a, this is a, a great example. So thank you. And just another maintenance shout out, the, uh, the ability to move that equipment and install it. Uh, we installed it. The maintenance crew has that level of uh, That's great. Yeah. experience. That's great. That ability. Sorry, Jen, didn't mean to cut you off there. I just had a question for it. Two questions. One is on the SHS grass sport field. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking of cutting down the trees? Those are fields out there already. Oh, they're, they're fields, not in the sense of soccer field where you tell it. And Playable it to, fields. Yeah. This is lines. Um, yeah. Really improving so, yeah, the, It's within, if you did an overhead picture, I, I, I should have thrown a slide in. But if you did look at, like, the Google Earth shot of it, you see where the field is. It's an overlay that fits right within the existing space. So where the existing field and baseball field that are back there, whatever, would be, like, just redone. I yes. think that, so it'd actually be playable because a lot of that stuff to the you right. You only have one irrigated area. Yeah. Has there ever been, like, a, a comparison to, to whatever that cost is to say, hey, what would it cost to put in a second, like, turf, like a practice turf there? What would that cost be versus? It's, it's interesting. Like, that's, a lot of schools have a second turf option, whereas we use the, the main turf for everything from 3.30 to like 9 at night. It's like boom, 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 boom. The, the discussions actually went in the, the opposite. They started okay. looking at the cost okay. of a second turf field and sort of morphed into uh, yeah. the discussion of having four. The reality is with the second turf field, you'd actually need lights. Yeah, the second turf field doesn't give you more capacity in the area, yeah. right? It gives you that one area that then you got to run throughout. What we're really looking to try to do with the expansion of these fields is get our practice times regulated a little yeah. bit more so we can practice after school instead of going home and coming and back. And that's how we have stacked up that yeah. turf field and half that turf field has just, I think, become a real challenge Jeez. for not only the kids, but the coaches, you know, you're practicing one day at 245, the next day at yeah. 8 o'clock at night, and it just, yeah. I think we got to get better better with that. Yeah. You know? Any yeah. question, Jason, on kind of the just point about the budget? Thanks. The fleet, two vans, one, two buses, one van. The outgoing members of the fleet, do we sell those, do anything with those? Do we get any kind of money back, even if it's low on the back end of that? Are they, like, too old to even, like, do anything? Uh, no, they're, they're uh, I forget the process exactly for, for the, we actually have to certify that they've been destroyed. <laughs> so they, they are, it's, it's, there's not a resale value. And Mark Salters strips every piece of usable, that, part. usable <laughs> part off of every one of them. And scraps like yes, that. he's unbelievable. And Neil, this might be a 10-1 question. I don't remember. But the bus, <laughs> the buses, my other question was about the buses, is that did we have enough bus drivers and this kickoff of school and the routes were all the yep. same as last year? Yeah. I'm just curious. We, well, we certainly um, had the same number of bus drivers as last year, okay. and we had enough to start the, yeah, so we did not, uh, last year we had monkeyed around to lower two routes, yeah. and we kept 26 routes this year. So we did very little change of the bus stops and the routes, which paid dividends of not getting very many complaints about the bus stops and the Correct, routes. Correct, I would think so. <laughs> if something has changed, in, in, because, in a good way, because whenever I have to drop any of my kids off at the high school over the last few years, and I come back to my house up, up Firetown, I in the past would just get stuck with a line of cars going to Henry James at 720. That is not the case anymore. More kids in the middle school must be taking the bus, or something is it still hasn't, I haven't seen it at the high school so much, there's still a lot of traffic to get there, but the middle school has changed so from what I've seen. Yeah, we, I don't know the exact date, but there's a day coming up, usually about three weeks to school, into school where we do a ridership count for a day. We do like three days of it. And then 
it doesn't JR will compare those numbers year over year to see. So I can probably grab that data. We'll bring it at the eight one at the ten one meeting. I would, I would like that data too. That would be very interesting. Okay, our ten one meeting is now gonna be gonna be a two day event. All right, can we can we move I'm on? So on? excited. On? I'm really excited. Everybody's excited for this first meeting. But can we move on to policy now? <laughs> I forgot I still have one policy. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm flipping through my book here. Um, so just a very minor item. This this was um, a second reading for policy. You'll recall that the um, coming out of a workshop that we ran in the spring, there was the idea to form another um, committee of the board, which was a finance committee, which then required us uh, a standing committee, I guess, of the board. Um, and that required us to go into the bylaws, write a little description for what the finance committee would do. We presented that in a first reading at the June meeting. And then this is now the second time it comes to you. So if you have that, um, exhibit in front of you, it's really just the language under E uh, for the Finance Committee that has changed, and everything else is pretty much the same. Um, and then you will be able to vote on that on September 24th in order to hold a first meeting of that committee probably early October. I think we have committee assignments on that agenda too. Yep. So you know, square the way ready to go. No, nope, you need nothing. You can vote next time. Any, any questions, anybody? Uh, public audience. So I was actually not going to stay, so I know you're all thrilled that I did. Um, I have to say, we did deliberately choose to move here for the strength of the schools many, many decades ago. The academics of the schools and we've paid much more in taxes as a result than we would have if we lived somewhere else that being said I don't really care if we're beating our dirk I care when we're falling in the dirk but I expect us to be at the top of the dirk in our town that's what I expect no matter what the rest of the state is doing not having 40 when I look at this, I see more than 40% of our 7th and 8th graders are not at or above goal in math. In, in Simsbury, 40%. 40% of our high school kids are not college ready in math. So no matter what the rest of the state is doing, it just tells me that other towns are failing to educate their students in math and other subjects more than we are. And that's not good at all. I can tell you when our college readiness numbers, percentages fall, that impacts college acceptances, which I know every parent in this town cares about. This reinforces what I said earlier about instructional time, professionals and resources being spent on emotional, emotional and social coddling. That time should be being used on academics. The money and the professionals should be being used on academics. That's what we send our kids to school for. But I see from a longitudinal perspective of over 21 years with a student in Simsbury schools is that we have exponentially shifted money and teachers and even the curriculum to address special needs and are really allowing the majority of students to fall by the wayside. The AP kids seem to be okay, and everyone in the middle is getting squeezed out. And that needs to change. Anybody else? Great. Uh, we go an executive now. Yeah. I need a motion. Can I get a motion? I'll make the motion. Go into executive session. Go into executive session. Get a second. I will second it. All right. We're, 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 we're,